It started with a few deaths in China. But within a very short span of time, the COVID-19 pandemic set off a global transmission chain. China made some huge blunders early in this. There was cover-up and denial. There were delays that were terribly important in terms of the spread of the virus in that period. Spreading across 218 countries and territories, with at least 85 million cases and over 1.8 million deaths, the pandemic has thrown the world into a vortex of fear and sent financial markets into a tailspin. From an economic perspective, the effect is lingering and it has been quite uh, devastating. One year on, are we close to seeing the end of the pandemic? It's still too early to say. I think we'd have to wait until the European summer. December 2019. Wuhan, a second tier mega city of 11 million people in China, became the epicenter of a deadly outbreak. A mysterious pneumonia like virus was spreading like wildfire and making people sick. A lot of the earliest cases were linked to the seafood market. It wasn't as scary as first thought, it wasn't always as serious as for example SARS in 2003, but on the other hand it was more worrying because there were so many more infections that maybe they hadn't realised were occurring. On January 20th, 2020, nearly seven days after the outbreak became known, President Xi Jinping warned the public of a likely epidemic caused by a novel coronavirus. But by then, more than 3,000 people had been infected and close to one year later, in the first week of 2021, China saw at least 87,000 infections and more than 4,600 deaths. China made some huge blunders early in this. We all know the fact that at the provincial level, there was cover-up and denial in a critical period in the final weeks of last year and into the early part of this year. Um, so there were delays that were terribly important in terms of the spread of the virus in that period. In the earliest days, the focus was on these patients with pneumonia. Later in January, the net was widened and what they found was actually quite a lot of patients with milder illness also had the coronavirus. 52-year-old Zhang Hai was living with his father in Shenzhen when the outbreak began in Wuhan. His 76-year-old father had fractured his femur from a fall, necessitating hospitalization and surgery. To facilitate insurance claims, Zhang Hai took his father to a hospital in Wuhan, a decision he regrets to this day. Zhang Hai believes that the local authorities were aware of the severity of the outbreak even before he and his father arrived in Wuhan. Had he known then, he would have avoided the trip and his father could still be alive today. I Zhang Hai intends to pursue legal action against the local authorities and the hospital in Wuhan, but it's fraught with risks. The Chinese government has squashed criticisms about the way it played down the extent of the outbreak during its early days. It has either threatened or arrested those who challenge the government. 
But this will not deter Zhang Hai, who is determined to seek legal redress. He is a murderer of crime, you know? Murderer of crime, because he murders his life. Murders his life. That means the real disease is always waiting. Including the news that comes out, they call him a murderer. Many people, because of the promotion of his promotion, lost their lives in the future. The pandemic's global footprint has continued to grow since the start of the outbreak and has today affected 218 countries and territories. Within a month of the outbreak, confirmed cases were reported outside of China from all over Asia, Europe, North America, Australia and the Middle East. By the end of the first week of February, 25 countries had confirmed cases with nearly 32,000 infections. The virus itself very much part of a larger ecologic trend uh, that we have been tracking and monitoring for over 20 years. And it's only a matter of time when the expanding footprint, if you will, of human settlements, agricultural uh, production, uh, is going to butt up against these wildlife animals that will allow the spillover, the jumping of that virus from its natural host, a bat, for instance, uh, into a human population. And as we continue to expand our population, the intensity and the frequency of uh, these interactions between wildlife and human populations will only intensify. Desperate times call for desperate measures. On January 23rd, 2020, the city of Wuhan went into a complete lockdown, causing enormous human and economic costs. It stunned the world with many experts questioning the need for such a drastic measure. Costly, damaging, premature jump towards lockdowns for countries that were ill-equipped to do that without provoking worse outcomes on poor populations, large urban, urban and rural poor populations. Um, we have countless examples of where the lockdowns proved to be highly problematic and counterproductive. I think it gets to the question of if you're going to use measures like that, they need to be targeted and not universal and crude. They need to be uh, uh, done in graduated fashion. Several countries shut borders, imposed partial or total lockdowns, and issued stay-at-home requirements in efforts to control the spread of the pandemic. But some countries have also resisted such extreme measures. Sweden, for instance, did not impose a nationwide lockdown. It saw relatively low cases in the first seven months. But just as observers laud Sweden for its unconventional strategy, a second wave in late October brought a new surge of infections, forcing the authorities to recalibrate their approach. But experts agree that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach to the pandemic control. We have quite a different um, context in terms of developed countries and developing countries. Uh, so when you impose a very strong uh, policy initiative like lockdowns and stuff, um, you know, prescribed by WHOs of the world, uh, there are different implications in and different um, in um, in a country in a developing country versus a developing developed country. The governments of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan have resisted extreme lockdown measures, and here businesses have remained open. South Korea applied its elite testing and tracing practices, thus containing the first and second waves of infection. It became a global model for managing the pandemic without draconian lockdowns. 
but a third wave of infections since November has forced authorities to restrict large gatherings and consider shutting down businesses. We need to improve our diagnostics. We need to understand how the virus spreads. See, maybe it's um, uh, bars or maybe it's surfaces or, or maybe it's something that goes on in religious gatherings. But to have the whole society shut down is just not sustainable. Taiwan especially has been extremely successful in containing the pandemic. It has become a poster child in the fight against COVID-19 thanks to its efficient contact tracing and firm border controls. With a population of 24 million, Taiwan has reported only 815 cases and seven deaths. Likewise, Hong Kong's daily cases never exceeded 200, and by early 2021, it recorded around 9,000 cases with only 153 deaths. I think Hong Kong's done a really good job, and I'm from Hong Kong, so I would say that. I think Taiwan's also done very, very well. I think they have the lowest number of cases of, of any location. Um, so between Hong Kong and Taiwan, those are really the quickest responses. Very, very proactive response, and also able to sustain public health measures with the help of the public. Southeast Asia was among the first regions to be impacted by COVID-19 outside of China. Malaysia has hit a speed bump as it is battling a third wave of infections with more than a thousand frontline medical workers infected. A state of emergency has also been declared across the country in a bid to fight the pandemic as COVID-19 cases continue to soar. It will remain in force until August 1st this year. Daily new infections hit record high, breaching the 3,000 mark for the first time last week and has averaged over 2,000 so far this year. Total coronavirus cases in the country have now passed 138,000 with 555 deaths. The surge in the number of cases has also put its healthcare system under tremendous stress. Singapore and Vietnam that had prior experience of managing the SARS outbreak have succeeded in controlling the pandemic. Singapore has done a number of things well and I think uh, first and foremost um, they've stepped up the contributions to science, the investment in science, uh, the investment in testing, in technologies, in rolling out, in comparing the different uh, PCR-based tests, the serology-based tests, saliva, uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, they've also plugged into international networks for um, new drugs and, and testing the drugs. And, and once you have that, it makes people more confident that, you know, if they come forward, they're going to get treated. They're not just going to, just going to be put in isolation somewhere. While the world still battles new infections, to date, it's China's draconian lockdown measures that have yielded the most effective results. Could the world have benefited by replicating China's extreme lockdown model? The pandemic has not only tested the ability of countries to cope, it has also seen the vulnerable fall through the cracks. COVID-19 has pushed millions into destitution. As a result, many from the poor communities are on the verge of dropping out of school. Our schools have been closed for almost nine months now. Now we don't know where it's gonna get open. We are anticipating a huge dropout when the schools reopen. Uh, because a lot of these families are struggling uh, and they have engaged uh, uh, their children or livelihood related work to support them or they are, they are working when these kinds of economic crisis happens. The marginalized groups get even more marginalized. As the pandemic hit the Philippines, the Duterte government imposed one of the world's longest and strictest lockdowns. It was hard on the poor and harder on jeepney drivers like 21-year-old Tricia Borromeo's father. 
yun po, nung nagka-lockdown po, ano, napahinto sila pa pa ng pagbabiyahe. Tapos, dito lang po kami sa bahay. Kaso nung tuma- habang tumatagal na po, kay- marami na kaming mga kailangan na namin ano, kumilos para siyempre naubos na yung tinabi nila papa na, ano, na panggastos. But even when the restrictions were eased in June, jeepneys were still banned from operating on the roads. The family only had savings for one month. Trisha's education suffered, first on account of lockdown, and then because of her father's loss of income. Dahil nga po sa pamamasada, dun nga namin kinukuha yung ano, pambayad namin ng tuition, yung pang-araw-araw namin pangangailangan, yun po. The pandemic has set the stage for the best of humanity to shine when people have reached out to the less fortunate. Trisha appeared in an Insight program in September last year, and as luck would have it, she was contacted by a sponsor with an offer of help. This generous support has enabled her to continue her studies. Ang inaasahan ko na po na dalawang taon na ako mahihinto, pero dahil po sa tulong niyo na, um, nakapag-enroll na po ako ngayong pasukan. But the pandemic has also had its share of dreadful moments. In February 2020, even as countries were grappling with the spread of COVID-19, a conservative Islamic movement came under international scrutiny. The outbreak was smeared with communal color when a mass gathering in Malaysia, organized by the missionary movement Tablighi Jamaat, emerged as a source of one of the biggest clusters of coronavirus infections. What happened in this Malaysian meeting is a large-scale one, and uh, during such gatherings, members share uh, some of their experiences during their missionary work, and uh, a lot of the rituals forces them to stay close to one another uh, during their prayers, during uh, dining time together. So this actually uh, allowed them to have close contact with, with one another, and this is one of the reasons why uh, the COVID-19 was able to spread quickly during such gatherings. One of the attendees at the congregation in Malaysia was 28-year-old Harry Zukifli. He spent three days and two nights at the mosque along with 12,000 others. Saya notice uh, benda ni, uh, macam virus ni jadi macam uh, tular kan. Selepas saya balik daripada uh, Masjid Sri Petaling sebab Sebelum ni kita hanya dengar dekat luar negara, especially in Wuhan, benda tu merebak apa semua kan. It was not until neighboring Brunei confirmed its first COVID-19 patient that the link to Tablighi congregation was discovered. All at once, cases in Brunei soared from zero to 50 in one week. It was then that Harry and his fellow Tablighis were contacted by officials to get tested for the coronavirus. When we went to Ishtima, we didn't think about it. So, when we came back to that, it wasn't just announced that it was a virus. After one year, after the arrival, we heard the news. The gathering had been linked to more than 620 COVID-19 cases in March with at least six countries tracing some of their cases to the event. As some of the Tablighis made their way to India, it triggered widespread Islamophobia and anti-Muslim rhetoric, with large sections of the population accusing Muslims for bringing the coronavirus into the country. The point is, no matter how stupid, no matter how irresponsible any one particular sect of any particular religious group is, you simply cannot use that as an excuse to begin to target everybody. The Indian courts came to the rescue of Tablighi Jamaat. They slammed the government for mishandling the situation and targeting a community with baseless charges. COVID-19 will play itself out in every country differently. It will play itself out according to the existing uh, social, political and economic landscape that it finds itself in. 
what you're seeing with the anti-Muslim bigotry and hatred that has reached epic proportions in India is partly to do with all the xenophobia that arises at the time of a life-threatening pandemic raging in our midst. But it is also a reality that India already had this hate in its environment. The judgment may have brought respite to the community, but COVID-19 in the country rages on as India reels under the weight of the pandemic. Before it exploded into a global pandemic a year ago, it was a mysterious viral pneumonia. Since then, COVID-19 has infected over 85 million people across the world. Many countries have used a combination of strict border restrictions, widespread testing and rigorous contact tracing to keep the spread under control. But the virus is breaking down even the most carefully built defenses. This pandemic has shocked health systems all around the world. The fundamentals of surveillance systems, of testing capacity at the local level, of the ability to conduct contact tracing, quarantining and isolation. Only a small subset of countries, principally in Asia, have been successful and had these systems in place. Um, and the rest of the world, including the most powerful and the wealthiest of northern countries, have seen their health systems overwhelmed and stressed to the breaking point now in a second cycle in the space of less than one year. And that's raised questions not only of what is it going to take for, um, uh, for building a system for future threats of this type, what is the investment uh, going to be, uh, in staffing, in basic capacities, in data systems. China bought the world time to prepare for the pandemic. It was effective in controlling the outbreak and reported near zero cases in March 2020. And it's already on the road to economic recovery, even as the rest of the world is in firefighting mode. See, as far as COVID situation in China is concerned, the only thing which favors China is their deployment. Deployment of their services, deployment of their testing facilities, identifying patients, doing their contact tracing, testing the contacts also, and limiting the public movement through lockdowns, through strategic lockdowns. China has a huge, huge advantage over all of the world in doing all these things. They did a million tests a day during their pandemic times in cities. They were very fast and very quick in the response towards any single case which they identified. So in that way, China being a close society, mind it's a communist country, it is close, the people are not so free as they are in the West or in India. The sad part is, I don't think people even today realize how bad and how vulnerable we all are. Despite our best attempts to stay cautious, take precautions, it still can sneak in. It's better to be cautious. And not only for yourself, I'm, I guess it's, it's about uh, your elders, it's about your family in general, your friends. I don't think you want to lose anyone anyways, but not in this manner where you cannot even be close. So it's, it's, it's real. I wish only more people would realize. Just to fill you in, are you, are you on audio, Azhar? Oh, fabulous. Author Suda had taken every precaution in the rule book, but it still wasn't enough in his family's defense against COVID-19. He went through a nightmarish experience when several of his family members were infected with the coronavirus. Except for my wife, the rest of us were all positive, which is out of a family of seven, 
six were positive. Uh, two of my children, my daughter, both my daughters were positive. Uh, my father-in-law, who lives in the same building, he was positive, and my parents and myself included. So what we did was we first of all uh, split up into two separate groups. So myself, my parents in one house, and my wife with the kids, and my father-in-law in the other house. Both his parents, owing to their age and comorbidities, had to be hospitalized. In no time, Sudam's chest x-ray showed that his lungs were affected severely and he had to be admitted as well. Within a span of a few days, his father's oxygen levels started dipping. The next three weeks were almost like a free fall. We didn't actually know what hit us and what to do. While you read up, you really don't know the nitty gritties of how things will get managed and what protocols kick in. You are only learning as you go. Uh, so that was the next fear. Can I at least say a proper goodbye? At the time of his passing, Sudam's father was still positive. Strict safety protocols meant that he couldn't be with his father in his last moments. Even the funeral had to be monitored and managed by municipal authorities. All you can do is be present, no touching. That was a fear, but fortunately it happened pretty much in a very compassionate manner. We were taken to the designated crematorium where we could perform the rites. I was allowed to perform the last rites while wearing a PPE kit and be proximate to the body but not uh, touch him. It was not the way that perhaps you would say goodbye in normal course. And anyway, we never planned on saying goodbye. Who's next to you on your right? Sarajan. It's a void. Uh, I don't think it will ever get filled. It was, it was so, so out of the blue that there was probably no time to even you know, prepare for uh, such an eventuality. Like I said, when we were sending him to the hospital, uh, I don't think we ever thought he would not come back. Ah, finally some ah. color. Okay. Now, uh, you look around and, and the person is not there, but the memories are. As a country that spends less than 2% of its GDP on healthcare, and where over 70 million households live in one-room homes, India has faced a daunting challenge. The nation's complete lockdown in late March helped slow the spread of COVID-19. However, once the lockdown was lifted, it became tough to contain the spread. We have to learn a lot of lessons out of this pandemic. We have to understand hospitals need to be made in a different way. We have to make a provision of having a segregated in areas in hospital where we can treat such patients who don't require, or who require high level of care. We have to upgrade our facilities. We have to upgrade our scientific research. We have to upgrade our research in the basic sciences to understand virology or genomics or genetics in a better way to face any pandemic in the future. So once the virus tries to evade that immune response, so we have to see how this genomic data from India or from other countries and how it is going to affect India, only time will tell. The sheer size of India's population makes it hard for resources such as test kits and protective gear for health professionals to reach every corner of the country. But, according to Dr. Satish Kaur, COVID-19 has given India an opportunity to transform its healthcare sector. In India, no hospital was made to face this pandemic. None hospital was prepared to go through this pandemic. It was not taught, taught in your textbooks, in your medical schools. So that there are a lot of transformational changes which were seen during this pandemic. First, the hospitals were segregated. The hospital labs were segregated. The use of PPE was taught to the staff. So everything was reworked. 
and this was reworked in less than six months. While India has recorded a little over 10 million cases so far, the number of recoveries stand at 9.95 million. The number of deaths recorded in early January was the lowest since the 31st May last year, according to India's Ministry of Health. The mortality rate being less in India as compared to the Western countries. So from the time where we had no PPE to manage patients in our hospital where the mortality is reduced, critical patients are being saved, that is a remarkable achievement as far as India is concerned. Small bump in the curve. I'm, I'm very keen to understand how the vaccination plan goes about in India. There is new hope with the discovery of vaccines such as those from Pfizer and Moderna, which are currently being rolled out in the US. But these vaccines are expensive, making them unsuitable for distribution in countries like India. All the medical technology which is being developed or any research which is done in the medical field always will have a bias. The bias for the richer nations, the bias for the countries who can afford this vaccine, right? There is definitely a class or what we call as, I would rather use the word, uh, vaccine race here. In this, the countries with a lot of money, obviously Western world will be able to win and they are already winning. We have got advantage of being the largest producer of vaccine all over the world. So we can ramp up our production facilities, we can help the world out. My hope is that what we will see uh, is the arrival of safe and effective vaccines from the likes of AstraZeneca, uh, Johnson & Johnson and some of the other promising um, developers uh, that will can be put to good use on a mass scale uh, in low and middle income countries. While the discovery of a vaccine for COVID-19 is an amazing feat, the world now confronts a far bigger challenge. The year 2021 is going to be the year of the vaccine. It's going to be the year in which we're tested on whether it's possible to have a fair and equitable access to vaccines. While the pandemic has taken many lives, it has also triggered an unparalleled mobilization of science and a committed search for solutions. There are today many vaccines that are being developed and a few of them have received approvals from their respective governments for emergency use. Happy birthday, dear 2020 was a really a challenging year, to say the least. Uh, not only personally, but to my patients, my family, and the world at large. So this, to me, uh, was the first ray of hope. Um, to me, it was like an early birthday present. I am going to go for my shot. Gastroenterologist Dr. Saad Jaffrey is one of the first recipients of the Pfizer vaccine rolled out by the U.S. administration. It is part of a mass vaccination campaign with high-risk healthcare workers going first. The pandemic has killed over 300,000 people in the US, more COVID-related deaths than in any other country. We have lost uh, about 6% of the healthcare workers, you know, got affected with COVID. Uh, thousands have died uh, from COVID-19, um, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, uh, you know, at the front lines. Uh, and let's not forget the grocery, you know, workers, uh, you know, the post, post people, the UPS types of folks. So there are a lot of frontline workers that we tend to forget and focus just on the healthcare, you know, setting. It's my housekeeping who comes in to clean uh, the rooms uh, for COVID people or the janitor. I mean, these are the people who are really at the front lines, uh, more than just the physicians, you know, I think. 
Several vaccines for COVID-19 have been developed at a rapid pace that has astounded people. Both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines use a genetic technology called synthetic messenger RNA that directs protein production in the body. Everyone talks about how fast this vaccine was developed, but in reality, uh, the vaccine was developed on the back of research done in 2003, 2004, and 2005. And there were scientists, including scientists from Singapore, who looked at the spike protein, who characterized its structure, who looked at how it interacted with the human immune system, and that formed the basis of both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, as well as a couple of the other vaccines which are in development. So it's not true to say this vaccine came up after nine months. It came up after 17 years of hard work. With the impetus from the funding part, that also helped, whether it was Pfizer putting in a, you know, billions of dollars to just go and do research irrespective of whether you know, they are successful or not, uh, as well as the you know, federal government you know, putting in uh, money and stuff. Uh, so I think because of the magnitude of the pandemic, uh, there was a need both from policy folks as well as the scientific community to make sure that something does come out. Globally, there are about a dozen experimental vaccines in late-stage clinical trials. But Pfizer and Moderna are among the first to receive emergency use authorization. So if we have a lot more variety of vaccines, then we can now tailor and match it to people who can or cannot receive. Some people are allergic to some components of the vaccine. They may not be able to take it. And so we can now start to vaccinate everyone regardless of what medical condition they may have. Because you know, if, if we only have one vaccine, then that's it. If they cannot take it, they cannot take it. But if we have more than one, we can you know, vaccinate more people. These vaccines are shots of hope. But according to experts, they may not be the panacea the world is looking for. We need the herd immunity at about 70 to 80 percent before we are confident that this virus is not going to, you know, get havoc on people. Um, so, number one, um, we need 70 to 80 percent getting the vaccinations uh, and number two you also need to make sure that it stays in our body in our system uh, for a longer durations and that answer we still don't know so from that perspective time will tell us uh, i think the question will be whether you know me going through a vaccination process in 2020 Will I need another booster in 21? I don't know that. 94, 95% efficacy and safety is an astonishing uh, uh, discovery and one that exceeded all expectations. These vaccines are a powerful and wonderful tool, but it's not a silver bullet by any means. As these vaccines are introduced, people cannot simply cease using masks, cease social distancing, and cease being cautious about congregate settings. If we prematurely abandon our behavioral interventions, it will raise the vulnerabilities to reinfection, reignition of outbreaks in this period. Even as the world rejoices at the arrival of vaccines, the discovery of a new variant of the coronavirus from the UK that has a higher rate of transmission has become cause for concern. It casts doubt as to whether these vaccines can help protect against the new variant. The coronavirus uh, does not mutate uh, as fast as influenza. In fact, it's probably closer to measles and mumps. Um, you know, which after several years, they, they, they become different strains. Um, but with measles and mumps, the current vaccines work uh, uh, pretty well. The technology that's used to create these vaccines is so flexible that if the virus mutates, you can just change the, uh, the structure of the vaccine. If you have a you know, vaccine today and uh, the vaccine mutates to something else, 
we will be able to generate the new mrna for that particular variant in the 6 weeks a viable vaccine will not reverse the economic damage that the pandemic has caused it will be felt long into the future especially by the most vulnerable from an economic perspective the effect is lingering and it has been quite uh, devastating and this covid crisis has kind of quickly put them under the poverty line people who were low income uh, middle class and without um, having some sort of safety net support they are basically has become uh, needing a lot of their hand holding so uh, the notion of the urban poverty uh, again has come to the fore how do we support uh, the urban poor uh, and this new poor group who are kind of somewhere stuck in a limbo situation covid-19 has delivered a global economic shock leading to steep recession in many countries while businesses are impacted there are quite a few of them that are reinventing themselves they are pivoting to business models conducive to not just short term survival but also long term growth so you know we to very quickly figure out how do we get keep keep our planes in the sky and how do we keep our bills paying and what do we do to actually support the entire situation in the nation Kanika Takriwal is the founder of Jet Set Go, a company that owns and operates a fleet of private jets and helicopters. The startup, often called the Uber of skies, mostly targets business owners who have to cover multiple cities in a day, as well as tourists traveling to remote areas. The pandemic changed all of that. I think we've always built the company on the premise that turn every adversity into opportunity. International cargo became huge for us. You know, how do we move simple stuff like masks, medication, basic necessities needed to be um, transported? I remember, and we, we've not really had any business in the logistics space or the cargo space. You know, we were a company focused on luxury, providing the best private jet experience. as we started getting used to lockdowns what we also realized was that we will have to bring a lot of changes into the future on a on a more permanent ish scale because ultimately zoom and webex had become the new private jets you know earlier people who had to shake hands to close a deal were learning to close these deals you know sitting behind screens so that was going to eat up into our market shares one of the things kanika is proud of is the fact that her company has been able to help people during the pandemic and pivoting from being in the luxury private jet space to swiftly serving people who may want to reach somewhere quickly on account of family emergencies i remember mom calling me and saying that um, you know kanika if your plane had landed 1 hour late this was a kid we were getting from guwahati to delhi for some urgent treatment who was undergoing cancer he said if your plane had landed 1 hour late i i think i would have lost my kid and you know thank you so much some of the changes that kanika made during this period will stay on to define the future of jet set go the pandemic has pushed many like kanika to reinvent the way they work but the recovery for many others from covid's shocking impact is going to be painstakingly slow i think it's going to take at least a year or two uh, and that's at least how we are planning it uh, that uh, some hand holding will be required the new poor has to uh, get some sort of support uh, uh, from the state uh, if possible you know this is a year unlike any other year we have ever experienced in modern times we need to be very humble i believe in claiming what we think we've learned in this period we need to be humble i think in acknowledging that there's still large outstanding scientific uncertainties that we are continuing to struggle with we're still operating in an environment of unknowns and we're going to struggle with that i i'm i'm an optimist <laughs> if we want to kind of set the stage for a better and more rapid response 
to the next pandemic, not in, only in terms of the detection, but the response to rolling out, the, making the vaccine, rolling out the vaccine, you know, or finding new drugs and all that. Um, I think we, we have to be driven by some level of optimism. With the arrival of the vaccine, the apocalyptic year has given way to a wellspring of hope. Still, we are not out of the woods. The world is rattled by new infections, making behavioural interventions like mask wearing critical for our protection. For Sudam, who lost his father to COVID-19, as heartbreaking as 2020 may have been, priceless are the little things his father left behind. Mementos of a life well lived. We all deal with it in different ways. My wife insists on wearing his bathroom slippers. So all of us have, uh, you know, latched on to some piece of uh, of uh, what used to be my father. Uh, I think uh, he's left a lot uh, through which he'll live on. Uh, he was himself uh, a prolific writer. Uh, more than that. Uh, prolific reader, if, if anything. So those are the things. Uh, we have books all around the house, so yeah, so everything is a memory. <laughs>